who's also disabled or both have disabilities. We've got invisible disability <laughs> and visible <Not> disability. <laughs> Hello, this is impromptu. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, we pay our, our respects to um, elders past, present, and emerging, and those who are online with us today for watching. Um, always was, always will be a Aboriginal lad. Um, my pronouns, uh, Cubby and they, them. For audio description, I am wearing a black sleeveless shirt with eyeglasses. My hair is colored red, orange, black, wearing headphones. I've got headphones. Um, and a small top knot. The background is the Broomback Writers Readers Festival logo. Yep. Who's next? Thanks. Thank you, Covey and your child. What's your child's name? <laughs> Her name's Krista. Hi, Krista. Thank you for joining us. Olivia? Oh, my God. <laughs> Out of complete um, habit and muscle memory, I just unmuted myself, but actually muted myself. Anyway, um, hi, everyone. So lovely to be here with you uh, this evening. My name is Olivia Musket. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm broadcasting to you from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and it's my absolute pleasure and privilege to do so. Um, I am a totally blind writer, performer, theatre critic, educator. Um, I think those are the important things. Um, and it was my, like, such a highlight of my career so far to be involved in this anthology. So I'm really looking forward to chatting about it with everyone this evening. Thanks, Olivia. And Sam, I've gone alphabetical order in case it was a surprise to anyone for <laughs> announcing you. Uh, thanks, Carly, and thanks very much for having me. I'm coming from the lands, the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land. Um, I acknowledge their elders past and present. Um, I uh, have a disability called pseudoachondroplasia. It's a form of dwarfism. Um, that impacts the growth of my uh, limbs and um, the health of my joints uh, is the summary that I've got to. I think we all um, have our brief one word, so, uh, one sentence summary. That's mine. Um, I grew up in central Victoria um, in a single parent family um, and uh, moved to Melbourne to... I guess, uh, to try and break a cycle of poverty, um, to get into university and I'm now a lawyer, um, and doing a fair bit of writing as well. So, um, I think we'll get a bit more into all that tonight. No, uh, but thanks very much for having me, Carly. Thank you everyone. And I am, um, a writer, speaker, arts worker, um, uh, appearance activist. I mostly write about um, what it's like to have a facial difference in skin condition, but I write on disability more broadly and some pop culture stuff as well. And um, I have a skin condition called ichthyosis, and it means that my skin is very red and very sore and itchy and prone to infections, um, but mostly it attracts very annoying comments, stares, and taunts so um the social aspect of ichthyosis is much more difficult than the medical aspect for me um so i'm here to talk about growing up disabled in australia and i'm thrilled that this book is still getting events uh, a year after it was released and i'm thrilled that it is still being discussed by readers um, i still get tagged on instagram you know when someone has read and reviewed the book which is just incredible um, I've just moved house, what, actually about two weeks ago, and I, and I had to find the book in a very big pile of books or many, many piles of books, actually. So I found the book tonight. This is Growing Up Disabled. Um, it is, um, the cover is actually um, an artwork by Wendy Dawson from Arts Project Australia, which is a disability arts group. Um, 
and it has 46 stories in it plus my intro as well uh, around the experiences of being disabled uh, in Australia and I'm really proud of it it's you know something that I'm probably the most proud of doing collating so many great stories from a variety of disabled people. I think that people think dis disability is a monolith and that we've all got the same experiences, um, even with the same diagnoses. Um, but this book shows that we have so many different experiences. Um, and it was due to come out in June 2020, but then a little thing called COVID hit. And uh, very early on, probably around this time, two years ago, actually, um, Kirsty from Black Ink and I were talking and we said all of the contributors are disabled and most of the um, audience we, we assume would be disabled as well. And we didn't want to compromise anyone's safety. Um, we also didn't want, someone said they can't see me. Can everyone see me okay? Yes, no, can someone in the um, panel say yes? Someone's in the comments has said yes. Um, I'm not sure, I might stop my video and come back on and off again. Is that okay, Gemma? I think it was Gemma that said- I think they're saying they can see you now. Okay, great. Sally, sorry. Okay, no worries. So yeah, um, we put off the book publishing until February, 2021, when we thought, I guess things might have settled down a bit. Um, they didn't because our small, small book launch <laughs> was cancelled on the day one of our lockdowns was announced. Um, we did manage to have a few events, which is great. But the good news is the pandemic has not stopped people reading and buying and talking about the book. And I think in the second week of its release, it went to reprint, which was amazing. Um, and so many people have been positively impacted by it. Um, you can see there, Krista is reading it right now. Um, I'm sure Sam has got his daughter Gwen on to reading it. Have you been reading it for bedtime stories, Sam? <laughs> We're not <laughs> quite up to there. We'll stick with Spot at the moment. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of swearing in the book actually. Um, so yeah, the book's made up of 46 contributors and when, when people, um, responded to the call out there were th 366 people that responded to the call out which was enormous um and it showed how the hunger from people to write tell their stories and also when we announced that we were putting um putting off the release of the book until next year until last year rather um we had people complain because they wanted something to read in the pandemic so people were really really excited to read the book um so I want to ask each of you what your chapter is about and we'll hear a bit of it um, afterwards as well. I'll go in alphabetical order again, Cubby. Hello, Cubby here and Chris uh, sitting beside me. Um, mine was a poem, it's very raw and it was supposed to be an entry for a, a poetry competition, but it, it ended up here in, an amazing uh, anthology. It's about uh, me and my daughter as migrants of color who are underrepresented in the disability sector and what entails to be disabled of color. So I think that's the gist of it. We also are very hungry to have ourselves uh, included in the table for among disabled writers. I'm one of the founding members of the Disabled Q BIPOC Collective. So we're all okay. Black Indigenous people of color who are disabled, who are living in stolen land. So um, there is that uh, group, we exist and we're here and we want uh, our voices known as well. Thanks, Cubby. Uh, yeah. Can we find out more about um, the the Black Q, Q? Sorry, I think I'm going to get the acronym wrong. Okay, the QC. Yeah. The QC BIPOC, is that right? Yeah. 
okay. uh, disabled Q BIPOC collective. So Q is from queer, B as in black, I is for indigenous, and then POC, people of color. It's a hashtag that's been ongoing on social media since um, uh, 2016, 2017. So it started, I think, in the United States, and we just adapted it here in uh, in our group to represent uh, the four of us, the founding members who are all from different sectors of society. Thank you. I'll find the link and put it in a chat. What about you, Olivia? What's your chapter about? My chapter, because I am the way I am, um, I couldn't decide on one thing or one sort of moment or story from my life to write about. I tried and it just didn't happen. Um, so mine is really about a collection of sort of snapshots of what it's like um, to be me or to be a disabled person and the interactions I have with, with people, whether they're incidental, like randoms on the street or teachers or, um, you know, uh, I can't remember exactly how many different letter snapshots I wrote, but there's at least, at least 10, I think even more. Um, I've never actually counted. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really about giving a, um, just quick little glimpses into some of the joys and some of the complete annoyances and frustrations of what it's like to deal with people's ableism and also what it's like to do like fun things and be a disabled person. <laughs> I was just starting to count them now. I'll count them when Sam's <laughs> talking about his um, chapter. Sam, what's yours about? Thanks, Carly. Um, my so I had a series of surgeries um, as a child um, and my chapter covers um, three of the surgeries um, and I guess the, the something that Cubby and also Olivia and a lot of the authors cover in their chapters is that it's not just as simple as telling a story about disability that life comes at you as well and that sorry that is my dog <laughs> um and um so when um apologies for this uh when, when you have disability then those things um compound into extra disadvantage so for me it was moving houses a number of times it was um uh, living in a single parent family, moving between regional towns. Um, when you have a disability, those things compound. And, and we know that that um, is the case with people of color or people of, of different sexualities, um, women. Um, and um, so I, I think what I set out to do in my chapter was just tell a little bit of a story about what it's like when those things really compound and, and you're put in a really difficult place. Uh, and it's not just the person with a disability, but everyone in the family is impacted. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of the stories talks about it, that intersectionality, um, not only of um, race, gender um, and other diverse components, but also regions and life experiences and poverty and class and uh, I think I know that you um, Sam Eliza um, Andy me we all wrote about growing up in regional or rural areas as well and I think the the, the disability experience is quite different in a regional or rural area because I think as you and Andy talked about in your pieces the time of school and work for our parents or um, carers mean that it was always a big thing to go to hospital because we'd have to take like a whole day or a whole few days to go and travel far from, you know, the big city or to the big city um, to have these sorts of treatments. And so that was a really different experience that I don't think uh, city people might relate to uh, or might not relate to and yeah. certainly when you add things like the casualization of workforce um where you 
do not have things like carers leave. Um, your, your parents then take that entire day off from a casual job. Um, they don't get money to pay the rent. Um, you can, uh, it, it raises issues of insecure housing, of, um, of diet, um, of, of all sorts of things that become these indicators of, of poverty. Um, and, and so I think that's something that we need to talk about in a nuanced way. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this book for me does achieve that. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Sam for talking about that experience in addition to to disability. Um, I want to talk now about why it's important for us to be in control of telling our stories. I mean, we we all know that and we all talk about it passionately, but perhaps the audience wants to hear some new perspectives. Anyone jump in? Um, Oh, fun. Okay. Um, like Carly says, to me, this question, every time it comes up, I think, oh, we're, we're still talking about this, but we are still talking about this and we need to still talk about this because it's so important. Um, I'm not sick of talking about it, but I'm a little bit frustrated with the lack of progress. But anyway, um, it's so having a voice to tell your own story is important to anyone. Um, our lives are unique, our lives are individual. We are all diverse by virtue of being human. Um, so we should, all should have the power to tell our own story. And that is infinitely, extremely more important when you are someone from a or several marginalized, you know, backgrounds, marginalized groups. Um, so for, for disabled people, that, that power has been taken, denied um, to us for so long by um, people who think they know. Um, anyone thinks, oh yeah, I can write a, a character with a disability because it's easy and boring and one dimensional and they're all the same. It's not that way. We all know this. Um, so taking back that power, um, creating jobs within, whether it's the publishing industry or the journalism industry or the TV industry to, um, to create that structural change, to allow creators with disabilities to tell, tell their stories, shout, you know, shout from the rooftops about their lived experience and what it's actually like and all the facets uh, and interesting parts of that is so important because A, we need an accurate depiction of what disability actually is because that's part of, you know, education for want of a better word, I think, Um, you know, educating, uh, non-disabled people about the disability experience and it, it, again it, it's about taking back that power and giving us that opportunity to tell whatever story we want to tell and they'll be all very different I think um, not every disabled person like me wants to tell random fluffy rom-com stories featuring people with disability because that's what I want to do but guessing it's not what everyone else in this zoom wants to do <laughs> So yeah, getting that that level of diversity is so important. And I've just waffled. So yeah. I second that. Hi, this is Kabi. Um, what we add is the race component. We is aside from being disabled, there is also racism involved. So there is what we call intersectionality, which is coined by a black woman in the United States called Kimberly Crenshaw. So um, intersectionality is very important in what we do in advocacy as a person of color and disabled. And more so triple whammy when we're queer as well. I'm non-binary myself. So uh, there are three different intersections and sometimes people cannot even accept or understand these intersections happen and we want to say hey we exist there mm-hmm. is three intersections in this in this group and there are stories that not being tapped on and not being told there's still that assumption that you can't be more than one thing surely mm-hmm. i think as well um it's so important 
um, for readers to know that people like them exist um, and growing up and th this happens with just with so many disabilities but um, with mine the people I saw represented um, in mainstream media and, and in books um, who were like me were quite often infantilized um, they were othered they were you know oompa loompas who were with people from it who lived across the river the chocolate river um, or mini me who is this weird sexualized hypersexualized sidekick uh, never never seeing myself as the main player in anything um, and so when we do that then a, a 14 year old reads it and says all right i can do that um, and i think that's really important yeah. I think it's also important to note that um, the, you know, Carly mentioned the hundreds of people who wanted to be in this book. And I know it was a really difficult process to narrow that down. And outside those hundreds of people um, were people who probably didn't even know about the opportunity whose stories won't be told. Um, and disability part of disability is an education issue where so often we're denied ed education or put into a different educations um, and writing is a privilege so I feel really privileged to be in this book um, and I think it's uh, all of our jobs to highlight the stories that aren't in the book as well absolutely um yeah, thanks for saying that. I, I definitely know when I've met people or talked to people about the book, um, even when the applications are closed, the submissions are closed, people were really disappointed. They didn't know about it. And I tried to reach as many people as possible, but of course that's not possible. Um, I also felt like there was a bit of gatekeeping, um, particularly in the areas of, you know, segregated education or work where um, the people that are very... Um, uh, you know, they're, they're very well-minded and their intentions are good, but they think that perhaps that disabled person that they know couldn't or wouldn't be able to be in this book. So there was that. Um, I just got two points to make on this topic, if you don't mind. Um, this week, Elle Gibbs, um, who is in the book, um, she tweeted about yet another news article that was about disability that didn't feature any voices. Um, by disabled people and her summarizing tweet was it's 2022 2022 ffs and that's a swear word there um we should not be having these conversations but we but here we are disabled people need to be the ones telling stories about disabled people this is not a controversial idea i'm so tired of having to um, say the same damn thing and i think you know, the fact, like Olivia said, you know, here we are again talking about it. We're talking about it because we have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have to make sure there are accurate representations of disability um, because, like Sam said, you know, the disability uh, rep it's a representation of people with his disability in the media is, you know, quite degrading and dehumanising. And the same with mine. Um, I often say I don't want to read another article about ichthyosis unless I've written it because the headlines have been just so terrible and often it's parents talking about their child with ichthyosis and they said something um, in good faith and the you know the journalist or the sub-editor publishes it and the headline is like um, you know snakeskin baby um, and so it's so important to have these accurate own voices out there. I'm going to ask now about um, what you hope readers got get from this book and um maybe this question's a little bit redundant now that it's been out have you heard anything from readers about what they've got from this book um have readers told you even what have you got from this book that could be good to know as well anyone cubby well, um, I was praised by my um, fellow artists who had disability as well that um, a person of color got into the, the uh, anthology.
because uh, there is that erasure uh, in in disability that people of color should not even be existing. I don't know why there is stigma in a multicultural uh, uh, sectors that there should be this model minority. So being in that as uh, a disabled uh, individual like myself with um, ASD, uh, they think uh, you should not be there. You should be model minority, you know, showing yourself really good migrant and person of color and but um, as I speak, uh, one of my uh, representatives of the Disabled Cuba Political Collective is speaking to a group of uh, POC organization who are very ableist in their artwork. So um, there's so much to do. We don't know where to begin in our side of the um, of this of this situation and since this is Brim Bank, I, I am from Brim Bank as well. Uh, I just want you to know that uh, NDIS started rolling out in this sector. We are having difficulty finding NDIS uh, support. Um, I don't know why are we are we invisible? Why are there no um, uh, providers in this area? If there is, why are we? on queue and on, uh, and, and, um, on yeah. wait list so long. So uh, there's so much to discuss in, in this area beyond, the discussion has, fraught, uh, has brought on a discussion further, yeah. moved along like, come on, let's, let's discuss this. Let's it open up a whole new areas. And uh, as in Brimbank rolls out with NDIS, it was simultaneous with the book which is uh, the launch of the book virtually. And it's fantastic that we're finally here in, in my side of town and, and talking about this because nobody has discussed disability before. It's an erasure. So Mel West, hashtag, hashtag Mel West. We exist, okay? All right. <laughs> uh, who, who's next? <laughs> I can go, Carly, if you want. Um, I, I was um, reading some of the contributions um, earlier today and it just hit home to me how all of our stories are different um, but intertwined. There are these commonalities um, where, you know, Olivia's talking about strangers coming up on the street um, and uh, I think we all probably would experience that um, and um, just the the idea that I, I saw and I hadn't realized before but um, that you internalize a lot of the society's expectations of disability um, to a point where you don't even notice a lot of the things happening around you you just um, you're dealing with it yourself and what I, I think there's, there's two categories of people uh, <laughs> who are quite easy, like, um, quite easy to define, I guess, for a conversation like this. But the, for the disabled people, um, that idea that you're not alone in experiencing a lot of this is really powerful. Um, and for the able-bodied people to say, to just take a look at, around and go, okay, um, this is how society is structured to raise barriers for these people in my life. This is my part in that. And this is what I can do to um, remove those barriers. I think that's what I want people to get out of the book. I'd have to agree with all of that. And even just say from just on a personal level, um, people like, People I went, like, I never thought this would happen to me ever, but, you know, people I went to school with and haven't heard from in 10 years or whatever and random parents of um, kids who I went to, like, a, a Braille music camp with or something messaging me and going, wow, like, I didn't realise all those things happened to you. I was like, yeah, they, they do. And I've sort of just 
that's life, you know, you get on with it and you get frustrated maybe in the moment, but you just kind of, well, I know I do sort of push it down and get stuff done and carry on, you know, um, and to, to realize, to see people realizing, oh, it's not that easy. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff that disabled people have chucked at them constantly. Um, so seeing people's reactions to that and seeing that, that learning, that, that, that gaining of understanding that hopefully sticks and continues on, um, and maybe the changing of some mindsets is really, oh yeah, I hope that continues to happen. And it's so powerful that it can happen and it can come from so many, um, you know, different voices in one, in one volume, in one book. I think Olivia on that, um, the, the, that process of um, thinking everything's just the way it is and you have to put up with that. For me, it was one of the difficult things in writing um, the, the chapter was that you've forgotten all this stuff that's happened and you have to bring it up again. Mm. And you actually, it was difficult to distinguish the bad things from the really bad things. Uh, and so um, for me, it's just a, a series of what I called my childhood, but actually there were some things that were um, really not okay. Mm. Uh, and, um, and I had to sort of, in my mind, um, bring out those things from, from deep within my memories. That, and that was a pretty tough process. Yeah, reflecting on that stuff and realizing maybe things you didn't realize were happening as a child and then looking back on them now you're like oh hang on that was way worse than i even thought at the time yeah that is so that was so tough mm -hmm. um for me as well i'm sorry that things were difficult for you in the writing of them um i i had the experience of that with writing my memoir but not so much i didn't put so much so much of myself in the intro but um, with the audio book, so that so this book's available in paperback, ebook, um, print on demand, so large print, and I think braille, and also audio book. Um, the audio book was supposed to be read by Kate Hood, who is an actor. Um, she, you might know her from Prisoner and Neighbours, um, and Kate's disabled, um, and she couldn't do it for various reasons. So I had to read the audio book, and it had been quite a while since I've I've read it. Um, since I read the book, um, it was sort of finalised to go um, probably in, well, it was finalised in 2020, uh, you know, to go to print um, for 2020 release. And so it had been a while since I'd read all the chapters and read the book as a whole. And reading the audio book aloud was amazing because I started, you know, I got to really immerse myself in it and I was reading it narrating it as though I was reading it the first time and um, a lot of those experiences that although different to mine really resonated because we share that commonality particularly around ableism particularly around how things have, you know happened in schools and in medical settings particularly and I think one of the shocking things for me was we've got people in the book that are um, or were when they wrote them still teenagers and there were people in the book that were in their 70s 60s and 70s and some of the experiences they've had in the medical setting and also in the education setting are still the same you know decades apart and I found that shocking that things haven't changed and they need to change and I really hope that educators and medical professionals can read this and think about disability not as a tragedy but something to be embraced and um, really put the supports in place for disabled children to live their best lives and not have to change because so many of those stories were similar around education and the medical settings I mean I related a lot with Sam and Andy and, and Al um, around the hospitalized you know hospital setting and um, you know Andy was talking about medical photography which happened to me and Al was talking about you know her experience with skin conditions and some of the stuff that that happened it wasn't okay and it's it's still happening you know we've seen that with um you know people like jess um newman i can't remember her surname now um marshall jess newman marshall and we saw it with um 
you know, Gail Kennedy and other people and it just, yeah, across generations hasn't changed. And I really hope that this can be a book that will change um, those professions. Someone in the chat asked if there'll be a um, next ser- next volume, a second volume. Um, I hope so. I don't know. Um, if there is, I'll definitely be passing the editor's baton for someone else to edit because I think that's so important. So, yeah, um, ask Black Ink. Maybe um, write them a letter. Ask, ask Black Ink for a second edition. I really hope there is. There's actually um, growing up in Australia, which Sam's chapter and my chapter, and I think Alastair Baldwin's and Gail and maybe Olivia. Yeah, me, me and mine too, yep. Yep, um, we're in that book as well, along with some other writers. So um, what I'm going to ask all of you, and this might take ages, we really only have 20 minutes. What is the most pressing issue or barrier disabled people are facing right now? Um, try and keep it as brief as possible, even though we know the state okay, of the world okay. is terrible. Okay. Climate be. change. Climate change, definitely. The summer is an endless summer. We had so much difficulty going through summer with pandemic and disabled is uh, what? How many, how many intersections would that be? Uh, it's just, it just, and health. I forget health because um, again, ableism is everywhere. Like even now, we are still in isolation. I have not gone out uh, with my child. We, both of us have underly- multiple underlying conditions. We haven't gone out and we do, we double mask and people just ignore there is a second variant. So I think health and the pandemic with the climate change is very poor, is, is Oh, top of the list, definitely, for me. Olivia or Ali, I, I was um, talking to Andy Jackson, who you mentioned earlier today, um, and Andy used the phrase with me, disabled ingenuity, and it made me think about this big challenge question um, because... We've seen over the past two years how quickly the world can change and adapt. Technology um, is obviously moving fast uh, as, as seen by the very fact that we can have this online event tonight. Um, usually um, you, you see um, that sort of change happen when it's needed to happen. And you see people with disabilities um, making technological change or um, or change in human thoughts because they need to do it. It's necessary. The challenge is when we use our disabled ingenuity and then it's stolen by the mainstream population and then something's not accessible all of a sudden, that able-bodied people use that disabled ingenuity and then make it inaccessible for us. Um, I think we really have to look um, at that, just building on what Cubby said, we have to make sure that disabled ingenuity stays accessible when it comes to things like climate change, when it comes to things like dealing with a pandemic and um, the, uh, the medical interventions that happen with that, like a vaccination. Um, we have to make sure that we are, um, uh, that disabled people aren't left behind as our technology um, uh, goes forward. I always get really overwhelmed when this question comes up and I absolutely agree with everything that Sam and Cubby have said um, because there is no one most important issue. They all intersect and they all affect each other and it's a big question. Um, But just to say something something different um, instead of repeating things that are already said and completely valid. Um, I think to coin, I think it was 
a Graham Innes phrase, or I don't know if he got it from somewhere else, but the soft bigotry of low expectations. And especially starting that from childhood, um, expecting as much as you would from a disabled child, a disabled student, whoever they are, than you would from anyone else to give them every opportunity to flourish and grow. And Carly used this phrase before, to live their best life. And that's become such a glib phrase, like, oh, I'm, you know, haven't brushed my hair, living my best life. But to people with, you know, disabled people, it is so important. And we are so um, often denied that opportunity to live, you know, the best life in the way we want to live it. So to change those expectations, to change those opportunities, um, I think, yeah, along with everything that Sam and Cubby have said, that that is a massively important issue as well, especially for me working with uh, disabled kids and seeing what is is and is not expected of them um, from their peers and parents and and teachers. Mm. Sam's just said Graham Innes did steal it, but ah, there you go. It's from um, an American race activist, but it's such a good turn of phrase, Sam said. Um, yeah, I agree with with all of that. I, I also think that we've got a real issue when the Minister for Disability isn't disabled and doesn't particularly care about disabled people. And um, I think that we need more disabled people in government, um, you know, at management levels of all organisations, etc. I think it's great that we have a Disabled Australian of the Year and we need to see absolute change across everywhere. Um, I'm going to ask now what is next for your writing career? This might be exciting. This is Hope. Anyone go first? Cubby. Okay, um, I'm working on a manuscript to include my formal uh, diagnosis of um, late diagnosis ASD uh, level one or from the DSM-5 or what they call Asperger's syndrome in DSM-4. That's the fastest I could go. <laughs> Amazing. Sam? Yeah, right. um, the chapter in Growing Up Disabled was always meant to be a book and I've uh, since signed that book deal. So my head, I'm halfway through writing that um, and hopefully it'll be out next year. Um, and to, there's a question from Adam, is there anything each contributor would change about their chapter since it's been published? Uh, and I, I think adding on, on that, uh, is the answer is no, apart from expanding into a book <laughs> <laughs> is my answer to, to Adam. So, so good. Um, it makes me so happy when contributors got book deals. There's so many book deals coming from this out there, Olivia. Yeah, maybe. Um, no, I just announced my first solo book deal this week, and I'm not allowed to say much more than that, um, except that it's very separate um, from, from my chapter and everything in Growing Up Disabled. It's still about uh, disability and, and, and effects of that, but it's, it's a very different project. But this year I'm also working on um, writing two performance pieces. Um, and I've got opportunities to perform those later in the year. So uh, one of them is at Footscray Arts Centre. So that's a bit local. Um, and so that, that's really exciting for me to get back into the uh, acting and writing for stage and performing world, as well as my fun little book that's coming out. And I'm also working on my middle grade manuscript that I've been working on for years and years. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I would definitely like to change what I wrote in, in the intro, actually. I would like to expand on it. And um, I feel like mine was really brief and, and I could have written a lot more, particularly around the history of disability literature um, in Australia. So I'm sorry I couldn't do that. And I couldn't even do that for um, growing up in Australia either. I tried. I did. Um, I'm not sure. Should we ask answer questions or should we have a reading of the book? Ask answer questions. Yeah, let's do that. Is everyone in agreement with that, Cubby Sam? We've got about 12 minutes. Yep. All right. Um, so, oh, Gemma asked a question. I can only assume 
it's sometimes tiring feel like you, feeling like you always have to put trauma on display. What is the best thing about being disabled? Ooh. That's not a hard question because I can't yeah. think of something. It's oh, a hard question okay. because, oh, sorry. No, it's okay, go on. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, it's a hard question because what's the best thing about any life to be honest there are so many so many answers but my pretty my my go-to answer and because it's pretty true is the people I've been able to meet through it and just the the fun and joy with friends that I've met purely because of 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 being blind of having a disability um so yeah just just the people and experiences I've had because of that that wouldn't have come up any other way for me, this is Kabi. So I found my collective uh, because we were all disabled individually. Nobody wants to listen to us. But as a collective, we were stronger. Um, we found each other. And um, as disabled people of color, um, it's just astounding how people listen to us as a collective when individually nobody would. So I think that was the best thing ever. And I love them to bits and hashtag mutual aid. It happened when the pandemic happened, we were exchanging um, care packages in the middle of a pandemic because nobody had the, the access of getting masks or even hand sanitizer, as simple as a hand sanitizer in the beginning of the pandemic. So those are those are the things that um, that came out uh, mm -hmm. since we had a collective. Um, thanks for your question, Gemma. Um, I, I think this happens less now. I'm an adult, but I got the question a lot as a kid. Um, don't you? Well, what, what do you think you'd be like if you were tall or, you know, if you didn't have the surgeries? Um, you know, it, it, it was a question with the assumption that there was something wrong um, and that disability means a deficit. But actually we have our, we all have our own path to find. And I'm really thankful for the experiences that it's allowed me to have. Um, and the values that it's created within me. I certainly wouldn't be the same person without disability, but I don't, I don't think I would be as empathetic. Um, I don't think I would be as dedicated to things like writing or the arts um, or any of the beautiful mm -hmm. things that I, I think um, I like in my community. Um, and I would have found a different community somewhere else um, and had different values, but I really like who I am. Um, and that's my favorite thing about having a disability. Great answers. Um, I feel very similar to all of you about the people and the mutual aid and um, the things that it's afforded me to do. Um, my disability means that I shed skin at the rate 28 times a, a person without ichthyosis does. So I look a lot younger than I am. So maybe that's the, the highlight for me that I can pass and sometimes still have to show my ID. Well, actually not really, it's been a few years, but <laughs> looking a lot younger um, and, and all the other things, the people, I think. Um, are there any questions? Any more questions? Um, Sam, can you please plug We've Got This? And the I think part, well, part <laughs> of the, so part of the story about growing up is um, what happens after that, right? And um, so um, I'm really lucky to be a parent now. Um, uh, Gwen, I saw Cubby's kid uh, in earlier and, and mine is in the next room. She's two years old. Um, and she has inherited my disability. Um, and part of my challenge as a parent is to make sure that um, she has every opportunity in this world um, and that the barriers that were there for me aren't in place for her. 
Um, I and part of the uh, what came out of this book is that um, I got the opportunity to write for another Black Ink book. We've got this parenting. It's about parenting with a dis uh, disability, and we've got a panel tomorrow at uh, five o'clock um, with um, Jack's Jackie Brown and Eliza Hull, who edited the book. Um, and so I'd really encourage people to come along to that as well. Thank you. There is a question here around language, and I did... Um, I, I knew that we were going to get a question around language. Um, as writers, can you share your thoughts on the need for language around disability to change? Why is the book called Growing Up Disabled as opposed to Growing Up with a Disability? Can I start answering this if, if that's okay? Uh, and yep. just jump in. Um, so disability isn't a slow word. It's not a word that we need to replace with the euphemism. Um, there are two or there are more, many ways of thinking around disability language, but two most commonly used if, if we don't acknowledge all the awful euphemisms around disability. There are, uh, there's people first, so person with disability, and there's also identity first, which, which is um, like disabled person. So growing up disabled in Australia, one, it's actually quite easy to say as opposed to growing up as a person with disability in Australia. Um, growing up disabled in Australia sees our identities. It sees that disability is part of our identity. It doesn't mean disability is all of our identity. You know, we've talked a lot about intersections today. It's, it's not all we are, but it shows that disability is a part of our identity and that we are proud. Um, last year on April 1st, which is April Fool's Day, and fool is an ableist slur, so I changed it to April Fun Day for the reference to this. Um, I had uh, Kirsty, who works at Black Ink, Kirsty's partner, um, Jen, redesigned some of the covers because when the book came out, even before that, and at all the events that we had, so many people were you know, asking why is it growing up disabled? Why is disability even in the title? People were really angry and it was mostly non-disabled people that were telling us that we shouldn't have disability in the title. So we jokingly, with the permission of um, the contributors or with the discussion of the contributors because we put it in our Facebook group, uh, we jokingly made some mock covers. They were growing up special needs in Australia, growing up differently abled in Australia, growing up I don't even see your disability in Australia and growing up um, I think I can't remember the last one I think it was like you don't look disabled or something like that um, and they were like mocking the euphemisms that we get and you know this book is all about telling our own story and it's all about being in control of that and it was interesting because you know the contributors had a laugh at this and some of them took part in it on April 1st last year but many of the service providers who seem to highlight ability in disability or avoid using the word. Many of them congratulated me on yet a new book. They thought that it, they were actually a book. Um, some people got really angry and rightly so. They got really angry that we weren't using the word disability in the title, uh, which was kind of the point of the, you know, the fun that we had. Um, but a lot of people laughed along and we really wanted to make a point that so often the word disability is erased and it shouldn't be. It's it's part of us. It's a factual thing. And um, when I, I recently interviewed Eliza Hull, I'll post the interview here for you. Um, and she was saying that she agonised over disability in the title as well of we've got this parenting of parenting by parent parenting stories by people with disability, by disabled people, parenting by disabled people. I think it is. Isn't is that right, Sam? Anyway, I'll post the link. Um, if anyone wants to add to that language discussion, you're very welcome to. Yeah, no, it's just another way that people want us to hide, you know. Don't use, don't use the language, don't draw attention to it. It's a bad thing. Uh, if I'm going to use the word, if anyone's going to use the word, that is completely, and it's there, it's each individual disabled person's prerogative to also not use that word if they don't want to and use whatever form of language um that, that that they you know identify with and it's the job of the non-disabled person to not police that because of everything Carly's just said I don't know if we have time for favorite uh 
writers, but Sam Elkin has um, asked that question. Favourite writers into them? or favourite writers outside? Outside, outside mm -hmm. I believe. Well, Covey's just held up Disability Visibility Project, which yep. I highly yep. endorse. Yeah, can you see it? Uh, it's it's American. So uh, this was what po uh, just before our book was launched. So this was launched first, and it was by an Asian, a uh, disabled Asian, Alice Wong, not Ali Wong, Alice Wong. So I'll I could put to the thing. Yeah, where's the camera? There you go. Anyway, so this yeah, that's that's um. That's their equivalent anthology in, in the United States. So I've got it's, that. It's also been reprinted 22 times. Someone, oh, wow. Uh, wow. Yeah, I, I saw a tweet the other day from Alice saying that. So amazing. Um, Olivia, favorite writer? Oh, no, don't do that to me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sam? Um, I always like to go back and read Stella Young stuff and it, um, it resonates years and years after. Um, but Stella um, uh, made me read a book called Too Late to Die Young by Harriet M McBride Johnson, who's a lawyer from the United States or was a lawyer from the United States. Um, and that's a book that I'd recommend as must, must read it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Stella also asked me to read... Um, or maybe not personally, I remember her recommending this book in conversation or in, in her writing, um, Pride Against Prejudice by Jenny Morris from a, a writer from the UK. And that, that was an incredible book as well. And it really introduced me to the social model. The, the book I want to mention right now is, dis, is Dreaming Disability Justice Care Work. And it's the by, one. Sorry? Uh, is this the one by? Leah Lakshmi. Oh, um, yes. Yes, Samara Sinia. And... Uh, it, it's incredible and it talks about mutual aid and it talks about um, uh, sort of like the often the burden of being a disabled person of colour and the expectations placed on us. So an incredible book. Um, it's 8 o'clock. Thank you so much, everyone, for talking tonight, for coming, um, for asking the questions. Thank you to Karen and Day. Thank you for interpreting. Thanks to Brimbank for having us and... Um, yeah, for keeping the book, you know, building the momentum still a year after. Um, as I said, it's available in ebook, paperback, audio, and print on demand. You can borrow it from Brimbank Library, borrow it from Borrow Box. Um, also, um, look out for Sam and Olivia's upcoming work and, and Cubby, and go to We've Got This tomorrow night. Thank you, everyone. Yay. Thank you.